So I've been involved with um, developing and promoting CAP, especially internationally, since about 2001. And these are the major topics I'm going to cover in the presentation. And so the first topic here is opportunity and challenge. So as you know, alerting authorities have long relied on commercial media, such as broadcast radio and television, to help disseminate public warnings. Many television stations insert crawl text. That's what I call this here. Yeah, crawl text. With the warning message, and the radio stations insert a message into the radio broadcast as well. This is a huge public-private collaboration. It's consumed worldwide easily tens of billions of dollars, and that is ongoing. And yet, you and I know this is where we get our TV <laughs> and our radio today. So the technology has changed. Something has happened. And because we developed this warning capability around broadcast radio and TV, a lot of people are being left out completely. They're not being reached. Does that mean we need to completely throw away those hundreds of billions of dollars of investment and start over? Actually, no. It turns out we have a huge opportunity for alerting authorities to reach people with targeted warnings through public networks. Not only radio and TV, the internet, cell phones, all these other networks. Here we see Google showing a storm surge warning in Newfoundland, Canada. Down here, a tornado warning is showing up and it's overlaying an ad that you see when you're surfing the net. Now, no, most of us don't even like ads that you see, but <laughs> you're going to get a warning if there's a tornado in your area. Now, for the alerting authority, this, for example, is the National Weather Service, uh, NOAA, part of the US government. Here, it's Environment Canada. Those weather services didn't have to spend anything extra to get Google and advertisers to show their alerts. The one thing they had to do was put it in a way that's easy to process, and that is the common alerting protocol, the CAP standard. Let's talk a little bit about the challenge we have. What is wrong with the current state? Whenever a major hazard threatens, technical agencies, weather services, for example, send out their notices, and that's when public alerting systems kick in. But each of these public alerting systems has its own particular methods. From local communities up to the size of entire nations, societies everywhere have this patchwork of systems often designed just for a particular emergency situation and a particular communications medium. I think it's pretty obvious this patchwork is really wasteful. But I'd go further. This is dangerous. It's dangerous if people miss out on alerts they should have gotten. It's dangerous if people get alerts that aren't intended for them, the overwarning. Or it's also dangerous when people get confusing alerts because they're not quite the same as they come from different sources. So CAP provides, if you will, a standard business form for the business of alerting. It's designed for any media, and it communicates information about any kind of hazard situation. The message can be targeted, and we usually think about the general public, certainly. But there's 100 times more alerts happening on the private side. The fire chief talking to the mayor, 
before we send something out to the public. The police communicating with squad cars, with back to the police headers and then to the mayors. All that communication is also CAP, but isn't necessarily for the public. So CAP supports private, and that can be either to an individual, like you're having a flood, so it's the operator of the dam who needs to know that that water is coming his way, well before the public's going to be told anything. Okay, so you can do it privately to an individual, or you can send it to a group. Like this is for first responders only, or this is civic authorities only. Without CAP, what we have are emergency messages in the form of a press release, a bulletin. Those are fine, and humans will kind of know what you're talking about, but that unstructured text doesn't cut it for automated processing. Before having CAP as a standard, all hazard, all media public alerting wasn't even feasible. You, you couldn't ask Google to say, well, go figure out how they do things in Buenos Aires. Yeah, and the thousands of other cities worldwide, they're not going to do that. With CAP, they have the standard format, so they're happy to do that. We have simple tools now that can be used to get critical messages to affected people wherever they are and whatever they're doing. So that's the opportunity and challenge. But I've been using a term, and Miriam mentioned it as well, alerting authority. What the heck is that? Let's talk about that for a second. An alerting authority at the national level is, those of you in the meteorological world, know about a national meteorological or hydrological service. Or you may be aware, you also have emergency management agencies, often at the national or city or county, province level. And you have other nationally authorized organizations. The key is an alerting authority is any organization that's officially authorized to perform public alerting. Now, we are not going to harmonize how everybody in the world decides who they designate as official. It varies greatly, and that's fine. They're sovereign states. What there is agreement is whatever you've decided in your country, let the other countries know. List it. Tell them. These are the guys we consider official. That gives us the listing we call the register of alerting authorities. Why do we need that? Because we're now using large public networks like the internet. And it's impossible to know your source personally, which was true in a small town. You get a, you get a message from the sheriff. You say, oh, I know him. You know, my, my daughter plays on the, on the baseball team with his daughter. You know, we know you. That's why we trust you to, that you're the right person to put out the message. Google doesn't know all these people around the world. AccuWeather doesn't know all these people. How do they know who's official? The International Register of Alerting Authorities was set up like a referral service. So you have a degree of trust in the source of the alert because you trust the organization that said they're official. This is the URL and screenshot of the first page of the International Register of Alerting Authorities. And I'm going to dive down by checking into the NOAA National Weather Service. You all know what NOAA is? National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's uh, part of the US uh, federal government. Here we're seeing the NOAA National Weather Service. And we see that the hazard categories for which they normally issue alerts are geo, met, fire, health, environment, and CBRNE. Anybody ever heard of CBRNE? All right, it stands for, oh, okay, chemical, biological, 
radiological, nuclear, and the E is high yield explosive events. This is the nasty stuff, <laughs> you know, this is the terrorism and the don't even want to contemplate kind of uh, issues. But we also see in this particular alerting authority that they have a cap feed URL. That's a place you can go to to get all of their cap alerts. If we jump down to that cap feed URL, this is what it looks like to a user. Underneath it, we actually have a piece of data that we can process, but it looks pretty to the user. This is the cap alerts disseminated by the US National Weather Service. Individual cap feeds, thousands of them. But they're already aggregated, so you folks in other countries don't need to know our individual counties in the United States. You have one feed that brings it all together. Aggregating. That's a concept we're going to be looking at again when we go from aggregating across the whole United States, aggregating across nations, and these are the idea of a filtered alert hub we're going to get to a little bit later. But continuing down this idea of the national or the international register of alerting authorities, how do we maintain this thing? It's set up by the World Meteorological Organization, a treaty level organization, that's why you can trust them, plus the International Telecommunications Union, which has all the standards for telecom. They are public private consortium, not treaty level, but each WMO technic or permanent representative, PR, if you know that term, maintains entries for their nation. Nation, not just their weather service. The PR is, by treaty, the representative of all of Argentina or all of Peru, okay? So that PR is listing all of the alerting authorities, including, but not limited to, the weather service. Right now, I think there are about 500 authorities, which includes at least two per country, the National Meteorological or Hydrological Service, and the Red Cross Red Crescent National Society, okay, NGOs. No reason that they shouldn't be considered authoritative, even though they're not government. Let me talk about the benefits of CAP. First, CAP can supplement or replace the single purpose interfaces between the alert sources. So here we have volcanic ash, we have tornadoes, we have fires, we have floods. Oh, and this is the, the hurricanes. <sighs> it's like, what's that little thing? And then we have the media. So interfacing your flood alerting, river gauges and such, directly to sirens. You could do that with CAP. Interfacing directly to PCs, directly to cell phones. That's a rather old cell phone. You still see the antennas standing out. And radio and TV as well. In that sense, CAP is a kind of universal adapter. And here I show it as a clipboard. You guys are probably all too young to know what a clipboard is. But before the days of smartphones, we carried paper. And you'd take a bunch of paper and put it on a clipboard. The idea of CAP. You still have all the forms you had before. If you're responding to a chemical spill, you still need your chemical safety data sheet that says this is how you have to treat that. Don't flush with water. You know, do this other, whatever it is for that chemical. That information is still something you need. But with CAP on your clipboard, you also have one additional simple form with just a few key facts about where is it, when is it, how bad is it, how certain are we? Okay, just a few things, but everybody, from ambulance driver to the mayor to the journalist, they all have those few things exactly the same way because they all have this one form that gives them the cap elements. We know the timely and appropriate alerting enables people to reduce damage and loss of life from natural and man-made hazard events. 
That's why we do CAP, because it works. When people know what to do, they can save lives, they can protect property. Alerting authorities who do implement CAP get to leverage the internet and other networks I'm talking about to get those warnings to the right people as soon as needed. We also know through social science research and out of our own experience when we're alerted, people don't act on the first alert of a situation. What do they do? They look for corroboration. Are you, are you hearing what I'm hearing? Could, could this be real? You look for that corroboration. It's natural. It's what we do as people. And with CAP, when you cross-check uh, other sources, those few pieces of information are the same. It's not confused. You got that stuff coming out correct. Now, I mentioned the CAP is a digital message format. Because of that, it's applicable to all technologies. It's structured and codified rather than just free text. Okay, I'm going to develop that a little bit more later. But because of that, CAP messages are really useful for customizing the messaging for multilingual. So for example, in Zimbabwe, they have a lot of people who talk Shona. Never heard of this language before, but it turns out, yeah, we can automatically translate to a great extent, particularly the coded values. Because when it's a code, it's independent of language. right? You just put that in the appropriate language when you actually present it. A cat message can activate multiple alerting systems with a single input. That reduces the cost, complexity, and delays when you're sending out alerts. Okay, in the typical emergency management office, you have to send a fax to the fire station, call the mayor's office, send a runner over to the police. It takes a while. And a sudden onset event, a tornado, a flood, terrorism, you don't have that time. So CAP helps you get things out really quick. On the receiving side, so now think of yourself in the emergency management office, and all this information's coming in, and you're supposed to put it all together. That's what you do. If it's coming in as CAP, you can put it on a map. You can see it all. Oh, we've got a, we've got a flood situation down at, at Route 50 and 29. We've got to evacuate people. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a CAP alert that tells me we've got a repair crew on the road that is our evacuation route. <laughs> Good thing I knew that, because I was about to send all this traffic into a huge tie-up just when they need to get out of there. That kind of situation is called a common operating picture. It comes from the military, which of course has situational awareness all the time. But the same is true of all emergency managers, police, fire, et cetera. They need that common operating picture. This is an example of doing it with lots and lots of your information already in CAP. <laughs> From a technology perspective, CAP is a breakthrough standard. It's opened the door to lots and lots of technical innovation. Just in the United States, I know of over 300 US patents around CAP. There's a couple of hundred different vendors of CAP software. What are those about? Well, one of the things is the geographic information in a CAP alert allows Targeting of landline and cellular telephones. Okay, we can target the train system in San Francisco when an earthquake's coming and have them stop the train because the earthquake's coming. Okay, alerting sirens. If you buy a siren today, it's a CAP device. It's an internet device that understands CAP. Digital signage. I see you have a lot of digital signage in Buenos Aires. In the United States, and I hope soon here, if you're in an area where there's an alert, the world, the nation's largest provider of digital billboards will put up their alert on that billboard. So you're driving by, flood alert. Instead of the ad that they would show, a flood alert will show on that sign. OK, this is all possible. Networks of law enforcement, of course, if you, if you check back home in your city, 
you'll probably find the police are already using CAP because they train on it. Incident management systems, modern ones, are CAP-based. Emergency management trains on CAP up in Emmitsburg, and they, a lot of countries go to that as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about home all hazards alarms. I think I see right there a smoke alarm in this room. Will that smoke alarm tell me if there's a, a flood? Will it tell me if there's high winds? Will it tell me if there's a shooter on campus? It could. About a $10 upgrade will make that an all hazards alert. Why not? What's the market worldwide that your building alarms become all hazards alarms? OK, interesting stuff going on. That's the Internet of Things. We'll talk some more about that later, too. All right, at this point, you're probably saying, this huckster is telling me a whole lot of promises, and I don't see how you're going to get all of that out of a business form. Well, let me show you why. <laughs> what are the characteristics of a cap message that makes that all possible? This is a cap message. And those who are techies are probably like, oh, yeah, we've seen that before. If you're not, I'm going to walk you through it. It's in a format called XML. And I'm going, to, I'm going to be doing this. That's not a gang symbol. Those are angle brackets, these little things here, greater than, less than signs. OK, that's the tag for a element and the end tag with the little slash in front. OK, so between that is what we're talking about. Let me, let me show you how that works. So, this particular cat message has the sender name, National Weather Service, Sacramento, California. Then we see the headline, see headline? Severe thunderstorm warning. This is how XML works. Tag, value, end tag. Severe thunderstorm warning for the headline, the description. This storm is likely to have hail, intense wind or intense rain, strong, damaging winds. And separately, in CAP, we have the instruction. Take cover in a substantial shelter until the storm passes. Now look at this one. This is the alerting area. Key, of course, to getting the message to the right people. The alerting area for human readers has this whole thing that if you're not in that county, you probably don't even know what it is. But if you are, you're probably like, oh, yeah, I know what they're talking about. But it also has the polygon, the latitude, longitude vertices that encompass the area that needs to be alerted. Humans are comfortable with the text. Machines go, hey, what? <laughs> Machines are comfortable with lat-long vertices. You read this out to a person, and they go, excuse me, how am I supposed to understand that? So with CAP, what we've done is we put the two kinds of information, or if you will, information and data, in the same message. That's the critically important feature of CAP messages. Just full text doesn't cut it. Text plus data, now you're in the sweet spot because the machines find it easy to use. The people still understand what they need. We have text values for human readers, such as the area description I just showed, the headline, the instruction. But cat messages also contain coded values, which are critical for the automated filtering, the routing, the translation to human languages. Etc. And let me just show some examples of that. So first of all, I already mentioned, we have the event category. Geophysical, meteorological, safety, security, rescue, fire, health, environmental, transport, infrastructure. And if it doesn't fit any of those, <coughs> other. <laughs> and here's a really cool one. In CAP, we have the ability to describe how important is this alert from the perspective of grabbing somebody's attention? They're not all the same. Sometimes you really need that person's attention because they have to act now. Other times it's like, well, I'd like you to know that there's a hurricane might come ashore late next week. 
different situation. How do you slice that? In CAP, three different things. And this is in the CAP standard. They are defined precisely. Urgency, four levels. Immediate, expected, future, and past. Past, basically, you can't do anything about it anymore anyway. So that's out of the urgency scale. Severity, we have extreme, severe, moderate, and minor. And then in certainty, we go very likely, likely, possible, and unlikely. And I'm going to dwell on that a little bit more in the next uh, presentation, or presentation after that, actually. All right, so now I've told you what's the opportunity and challenge. I've told you a little bit, well, what are alerting authorities, and what are the benefits of CAP, and why does the CAP message make all that possible? Now I'm going to put it all together and show you some examples of alerting systems based on CAP that are out already. Here's a typical one. This was a company that's since been acquired by, um, what is it? Oh, BlackBerry, folks. Uh, but this system will take your CAP messages and put them out to speakers, directly to sirens, internet posting, electronic signs, the digital billboards I was talking about, SMS text messages, email, telephone alerts, and those are old style telephones, as well as smartphones. You get out to social networks, you get out to cable TV, et cetera. Let me talk about national level uh, implementations of CAP, and I'll just walk through this really quickly. And then I want to also talk briefly about NGO and commercial implementation. So we're going to do the government slice and then talk about the non-government and commercial. And I'm just going to go uh, around the world in a, a slice by the, uh, first of all, the Americas. For the Americas, here I'm listing 25 countries or territories with operational or in-progress CAP implementations. I'm just going to remark on a couple of those as we go by. Here's the CAP feed URLs for several United States CAP implementations maintained by alerting authorities that are in the register of alerting authorities. So we have NOAA. You already heard about the National Weather Service. We also have their Tsunami Warning Center. One of the first implementations of CAP was USGS, United States Geological Survey, where I worked for many years, so they have a place in my heart. Uh, earthquake alerts. And now they have the USGS volcano alerts as well for the volcano hazards program. And then the Environmental Protection Agency, they have air quality alerts. Big thing right now in California with those wildfires. And then we have something from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which kind of pulls things together into what's called the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. And here's its diagram. A little complex, but <laughs> essentially what they're doing is they're taking CAP feeds from lower levels of government, cities, counties, and states, gathering them together and pushing them out via a variety of media, including all cell telephones in the alerting area. And that's not just smartphones, those are plain old cell phones, which is something called cell broadcast. This one site has the National Weather Service as one of its inputs. And remember, the National Weather Service has a couple of thousand, I think more like 3,000 cap alert feeds. So 3,000 go into one. And that's combined with 1,129 other cap feeds from counties and cities, which makes one U.S. national level feed, which we then combine, as Miriam has already showed you, into the alert hub with, at the moment, about 70 other countries. OK, so this is aggregating up because you want them aggregated so that you get everything about your area of interest. OK, alerts for Buenos Aires do not only come from Buenos Aires. <laughs> they come from national level, international, particularly like earthquakes and stuff. OK. Now, in South America, I know about Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Guyana. And you may know the CAP alert system in Brazil is called Alert AS, 
AS being Spanish uh, for South America. And that's because it is available to be used freely by any nation in South America that wishes to use it. So you don't have to actually do your own implementation if you want to use that one, OK? And of course, Argentina could offer the same thing once they get their thing together. Um, let me turn now, though, to Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. So here I'm aware of operational or in-progress CAP implementations in these 48 countries. And in Europe, there's a system called a Medio Alarm, which predated CAP, but now is also interoperable with CAP because they put out CAP feeds at the national levels. This is operated on behalf of the 36 European National Weather Services. And actually, they include Israel at the moment as well. And Russia, um, actually Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan are doing a separate similar system called Medio Alert. And Russia, Ross Hadramet is up on that now. Let me switch to Africa. I'm aware of 11 countries with operational or in-progress CAP implementations. Um, I'm working with Zimbabwe at the moment. Uh, so that's why we were doing the Shona language. And here's the Asia Pacific. And here I'm aware of operational or in-progress CAP implementations in these 25 countries. And James, you see Australia, but it's really New South Wales. <laughs> so it's not all of Australia, but it's a place in Australia. I want to talk a little bit, though, about CAP in China. And that's because, as far as I know, it's the world's largest. CAP implementation. It's called the National Early Warning Release System, NEWERS. It gathers information from emergency command sectors and disseminates that information to the public and emergency management personnel throughout all of China. They have one national center, 31 provincial, 343 municipal, and 2015 county level centers. I believe they call them cantons. <laughs> Let me switch now to NGOs, non-government organizations, and commercial implementations uh, of CAP. I think you'd agree the most prominent NGO in the context of emergencies is the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, IFRC. IFRC launched their universal app program in 2013. And that provides common templates so that each of these 192 Red Cross, Red Crescent national societies can customize and distribute free mobile apps. And that, <laughs> I'm sorry, that doesn't apply. First of all, we started late. And besides, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mix and match how, far, how much time I spend on each thing. The Hazards app allows people to get free public alerts because of the cap feeds. So they, in effect, IFRC is another alert hub that pulls it all together and then pushes out to people who sign up for their app. OK? The cool thing, though, is they don't stop there. National Weather Service puts out an alert that you're going to have a flood. They say, go seek shelter, or they tell the national civic authority, and the civic authority says, go seek shelter, right? Where's my shelters? Civic authorities don't know. The Weather Service doesn't know. Red Cross knows. They're using that same one form, and they're saying, oh, here's another form. Your shelters right now are half a mile away, only two beds available, two miles away, 10 beds available. I can make the decision. I think I'll go for the one with 10 beds, because the time I get there, they're going to be out. You can make your own decisions, because that other voice for authoritative information is using the same infrastructure of CAP alerts. Or you say there's going to be high winds, and people are going to get hurt. They have the app for how to give first aid. Okay, And that's customized to the local situation. So if it's a health alert and it's Ebola, it turns out you really need to know how to handle dead bodies before you get involved at all. 
in an Ebola situation. Well, you know, that's the kind of information Red Cross has, and they work with us to get it all out. It's a very nice example of how these things build on each other. I will also point out that the Hazards app can be shared with any official alerting authority. So if your police or fire or your own med center wants a easy way to put out cap alerts, ask your Red Cross. They say, oh yeah, we'll sign you up. You can use our little app for putting out cap alerts. Google has been involved for years with CAP, and there's a site called Google Public Alerts. They bring information to anybody using Google products. You're all familiar with Google Search? Whether you like it or not, it's a different issue. If you're searching for where to go buy a pizza, but there's a flood warning in your area, you'll get the flood alert. Okay, not because you searched for flood. You searched for pizza, but they know where you are. They have to know where you are there, otherwise they give you, you know, pizza places in Australia when you're sitting here in Argentina. So they know where you are, they know there's an alert, they'll warn you. Okay, same with uh, Google Maps. Okay, so if you're driving along, there's a tsunami alert, the whole area turns red, and you're Navigator tells you to turn right at the next light. Interestingly enough, IFRC, Red Cross, Red Crescent, worked with Google to create the What Now service, which is a data feed of actionable and contextualized messages concerning how to prepare for and respond to local hazards. Starting to sound like IBF. Impact-based forecasting, what is it that people need to know so that they can act given this situation? This already exists, and they, it's based on the public alerting and public education messaging, which has been field-tested with social science research so we know people actually do understand these messages. And there's an example down here on what they put out in the case of a typhoon warning. So something you could take advantage of. Already out there with our, our partners over in the Red Cross. Let me turn to commercial. And first I'm going to talk about commercial uh, weather alerting. AccuWeather has integrated publicly available warnings from the governments of over 50 countries, many using CAP, into AccuWeather.com. And they reach 1.5 billion people globally in over 100 languages. Then there's Meteo France. Meteo France Vigilance is implementing CAP. They have a very strong relationship with the National Civil Security Organization. 90% of French people, people in France <laughs> and its territories, know about the Vigilance system. That's a huge rate of penetration from a marketing perspective. Medio France International also supports cap alert creation and dissemination through their product suite known as Medio Factory, which is used in, in 14 countries, including here, I understand. But also Cambodia, Egypt, um, India, et cetera. Then we have the Weather Company, which is now an IBM company because they were acquired recently. They have something for creating cap alerts, another piece of freeware uh, called the Local Alerts Platform. And here you'll see that they, and the same is true of AccuWeather, are depending on somebody we trust putting it all together so that they can go and get the alerts to put them out on their apps, to put them out on their cell phones, however they reach people, okay? That alert hub situation is critical. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we get down the line. Because if we didn't do that, AccuWeather and the weather company and Google would have to deal with 192 sovereign nations. They don't want to do that. And why should they? They're, they're, they're not diplomats. I mean, pretty obviously not diplomats in some cases. At any rate, so they want official trusted sources to gather that all together. That's the alert hub. But I also mentioned briefly at the beginning, sensors 
that emit CAP alerts. And here we have the in-home monitors that are becoming all hazards. We have a smoke alarm called Halo Plus, developed for emerging economies and frankly for the slums around Rio or around Johannesburg where there are no firewalls between houses. So if there's a fire in one of these shacks, you know, half a mile away, it's in your house, essentially, because that, so all of their smoke alarms are network devices. Ah, now that they're network devices, they can be all hazards alarm, and that's exactly what they're doing. The same for this particular sensor for in-home particulate matter which is a kind of strange term, but think Beijing. <laughs> think about places where the air gets really dangerously dirty sometimes, and you have sensors that do that. Also, Earth Networks puts out cap alerts based on the static that occurs whenever lightning is exchanged between clouds, cloud to ground, or within a cloud. That static is their signal. Because using just that, they can map thunderstorms. And they put out cap alerts saying, this is where we think the thunderstorms are. We also have, um, this is for evaluating on a very precise, what is a precise uh, scope? What is the situation in terms of this particular building, floor by floor? So as the earthquake has gone through, these sensors attached to the girders of the building tell you floor two needs to be evacuated. Floor three is OK. Fourth floor is also OK. Floor five, get people out of there. Very precise, easily done, but it's a whole other level from where we are right now. These devices do exist. And I talked briefly about that overlay of ads. This is in the United States, and I understand also in Brazil now, and Canada. Federation for Internet Alerts will overlay the ad with your emergency alert. It's in their self-interest to do it. You might not think of ad companies as your natural partner, but they can be. At the city level, and I don't track these, but I'm aware that IBM markets a product for managing cities. It's called the IBM Intelligent Operations Center for Smarter Cities. That supports CAP. Microsoft has a competing product called Microsoft City Next, also supports CAP. So when you go back home, talk to some of your city level managers, and you may well find they've already got CAP-enabled systems. One of the earliest implementations of CAP was for hate group monitoring in Germany. Another one that I think is really cool is Neighborhood Watch. Do you all have Neighborhood Watch in your countries? This is very, very local information that can be CAP enabled so that you can tie into the local police if you want to. So that if you say, oh, there's somebody we don't recognize down with the recycling center at the end of our street, and he's carrying something that looks like a gun. The police are monitoring you. They see the trigger word gun. They say, please stay in your houses. <laughs> We're sending a squad car over. We will investigate. We'll let you know what we find. OK? You can hook up to the police, because police are using CAP. Use CAP locally. You can share. And then not only do they monitor you, but if they have something to say to you, their alerts come directly in, and you can add your context to it. We also have very sophisticated applications and a lot of money being made on making cap alerts out of news stories. This particular one is in Hungary. It's the National Emergency and Disaster Information Service, EDIS. This is the EDIS alert map. And the, way, the reason I like to show it is it's unusual because it includes a couple of potential extreme events. One is super volcanoes. Another one is Earth approaching objects. OK, think about what if the dinosaurs had this? You know, so they would, of course, then where are they going to evacuate to? So eh, they're kind of screwed no matter what they do. But fortunately for life on Earth, those don't happen very often. So we're going to be all right for a while. All right, 
Before I leave this presentation, let me talk about alert hubs. And fundamentally, an alert hub is a site that aggregates CAP alert news feeds in one location. And here, I've already talked about a couple of aggregators. The National Weather Service is an aggregator of counties. The US IPAWS is an aggregator of states and cities and counties throughout the US. And then the WMO Alert Hub is an aggregator across nations. So we have aggregators. But here I'm focused on putting all of that on the global cloud infrastructure. So those of you who don't know about cloud, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what the cloud does. First of all, the benefits of a CAP Alert Hub on the cloud, speed. Dissemination time is crucial for certain sudden onset events. Earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, terrorist strikes. We just don't have seconds. We've got a second. We need to get it out right away. We can do that on the cloud. Scale. The global scale dissemination infrastructure provides high performance at a reasonable cost. High reliability. The whole cloud rarely goes down. And all the clouds together have never gone down. So if we put it on multiple clouds, you got almost certain reliability and high availability. It just stays up. There's also inherent redundancy. So if you put your alert on the global cloud aggregator, even if your server goes down, people are still getting the alert because this other center, Google or whatever, is passing it out. And they're not saying it's a Google alert. They're saying it's a National Weather Service alert. It's your alert. They're just helping disseminate it. Okay, So they're not getting into your business. They're just helping you with your business. And on the global scale infrastructure, that's critical because you can go down. And it's almost the definition of an emergency in your area. You're pretty likely to go down. All right? Your, your microwaves will go down. Your cell towers will go down. Your internet will be disruptive. And in any case, you're really, really busy <laughs> with lots and lots of traffic. So you're going to be slow, if not completely down. So redundancy is really good. Security and authenticity. Those of you who've ever tried to handle online systems recently, you're spending a whole lot of money and you're not keeping up. The nasty folks in cyber warfare are breaking in all the time. Well, these guys on the cloud have to deal with that. They've got really good resources to deal with that. So it's an advantage to take a, uh, that we can take advantage of. Analytics, what's that about? You put out an alert and it goes to people in your alerting area. Well, that's a pretty big area. Hurricane Katrina, the whole city of New Orleans. And you're sitting there going, well, we put it out, but I wonder if people got it. You put out an alert, and it's got a, a pointer to say, go here for the detailed information. You get a heat map showing who is clicking through. right? So you can see neighborhood by neighborhood who's already gotten the alert. And frankly, 60% coverage is Fine. Don't go for 100%. You don't need to. 60% is full coverage. This neighborhood's only 30%. I want my police with their bullhorns to go there. Don't spread your effort over this whole area, because you're warning people who already got the message. Go to where we now know they didn't get it for whatever reason. Maybe their cell tower is down. Maybe people there just don't own cell phones. So we can use this analysis by having a central system to put it out. We do have a prototype of this already. Um, it's being, it was offered by the United States as a prototype for the WMO Alert Hub. And it's called the Filtered Alert Hub Technology. It's free. It aggregates cap alerts from sources worldwide. Um, and it's called filtered because we then create customized filters. So there is, right today, a filter for Buenos Aires. It says, here's the official high priority public alert for Buenos Aires from everywhere in the world. Now, we don't have all the countries in the world. We only have 70. But you can already go there and get those. And that's the same for 2,000 uh, cities around the world. 
We also, on this, have the ability to push that alert immediately to the hub. Remember those sudden onset things where you don't have 10 seconds to get it out, you've got a second? Well, don't wait until you can pull the feed once a minute, because that means you could be as much as two minutes after it was posted. You push it directly to the hub. The hub pushes it directly out to the cell phones. We can get it from the posting to the cell phones within two seconds. Okay, That's fast enough to warn you of an earthquake shaking that's still on its way to you. Okay, It's fast enough to warn you if there's a terrorist in a bus on the other end of London Bridge who's coming to your end. That's what we can do. Okay. We also have on the Alert Hub a, a web form so the people who want to post immediately can do it right on the Hub. This is your interface. And you'll recognize this interface because you're going to install it this afternoon on your PCs. This is part of, um, yeah, part of, whoops. Oh, yeah, part of the <laughs> NOAA Big Data Project. But first, I just wanted to show this. If you go to this site, alert-hub.org, you can see the alerts um, that are being posted at the moment, uh, what are the sources, and uh, what are the available subscriptions. That's where you, This second one here is where you get the Buenos Aires, for example. And then something about the project itself, which is part of the NOAA Big Data Project. Uh, I'm leading it. Um, our partners include uh, Amazon Web Services, um, which gave me a generous grant to do this. Um, AccuWeather, uh, Open Commons Consortium. Their focus is making sure you have the ability to put your application like this on any cloud, not just Amazon. We want to run it on Azure. We want to run it on Google Cloud. On as many as people want to install, you can. We also have, uh, as one of the partners, OFDA. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. Here you guys are probably almost all from the weather or meteorological side of the world. The emergency management side, if you will, the counterpart for me is OFTA, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, uh, who are helping the emergency management organizations come to the same place you're going to. IBM and the weather company are there as well. All of it is free, open source in the public domain. If you'd want to join, just let me know. This is the prototype. Uh, I already mentioned it's uh, offered for WMO in their, um, I think they consider it to be an uh, um, official offering of the United States, and um, they're, building, they're building around that. So let me just summarize my key points, and then we're just about, I guess, 10 minutes late for uh, when we're supposed to break. My key points, a basic challenge for public alerting is the crazy patchwork we have because of all these different ways of doing one by one each kind of uh, hazard for each kind of media. We don't want to be there. And we don't want to be constrained to just press release free text. We can gather the data right in. CAP didn't invent that. CAP is merely using XML, which is the way you do data and information in the same document, or in our case, a message. We talked about alerting authorities, which is anybody, as long as you are authorized by your government to perform the function of alerting. And then you let other governments know through the register. CAP can help you assure that alerts are timely and that they reach everyone who needs them and only those who need them. That's the alerting area being very precise. It's not just Sacramento County. It's this polygon. Right? CAP allows an alerting authority to activate multiple alerting systems with a single input. Cool thing, I think, for uh, meteorological agencies. Certainly it is for uh, things like mayor's office, civic authorities, et cetera. And for an emergency operations center, or for people like Google or whatever, to pull everything into one place for their situational awareness which they typically have as a map-based tool called the Common Operating Picture. CAP fits very well into that. 
And remember, again, emphasizing cat messages are not merely text. They have the data right in there. And I looked at uh, with you at the raw cat message in its machine-friendly XML format. And that gets made human-friendly, even though it's still XML underneath, human-friendly, like on your web page in HTML, through a thing called a style sheet. And I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. And then I gave you a partial survey of cap-enabled alerting systems that I happen to be aware of. There is nobody at the moment whose job it is to track cap. I mean, WMO might start tracking it, but only for NMHSs. Okay, who's tracking it worldwide? Uh, ITU says they're interested, but they don't actually have staff. So we don't know where all the CAP systems are, certainly not at the city and county level. But these are the ones I know of, so that's what I presented. And then I talked about alert hubs. You also may find useful to go to these links for a series of workshops that I started running in 2006 at the International Telecommunications Union, uh, the then director of um, uh, information services, I think it was called at the time, Jack Hayes, who was the uh, director of the U.S. National Weather Service, gave the keynote in 2006. But we've had these over the years. Uh, those links, particularly the most recent ones, will take you to some very interesting presentations. And the next one's coming up in Hong Kong. Uh, some of you from this actual room will be there. I know Miriam will, uh, to make presentations. Here's a pointer to various resources about CAP including my summary of where things stand nation by nation. And that's kind of it. So at this point, let me turn it back over to you to announce what we're doing for our break. And then when we come back, I've got some more uh, presentation material to go through. Great. Thank you.
vendors of capsules.